It is an absolute pleasure to introduce to all of you Subodit Mukherjee. He has been recently appointed an associate professor at uh, the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. Uh, and here's and, and he's joining us virtually to talk about multi-messenger cosmology and what can we learn from it. Uh, so if there's not much further ado, uh, the audience is all yours, Subodip. You can begin whenever you want. Great, thanks a lot for the introduction and for inviting me for giving this talk. So as usual, please feel free to interrupt me whenever you want and you should because I should make sure that I'm not falling asleep. I will make coffee, but still you should ask me questions whenever you want to have any doubts about anything. So today for at least an hour, I'm going to talk to you about multi messenger cosmology and what can you learn from it. So when, as soon as I start, say about multi messenger cosmology, this talk is about going to be only two of the multi messengers part. There are three of them. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about neutrinos today. I'm just going to talk about the electromagnetic probes I'm showing in the left hand side and the gravitational wave probes uh, in the right hand side. So electromagnetic probes of the universe is one of the, our oldest medium to connect ourselves with the cosmos. We have mapped the sky in uh, several frequency bands, starting from radio, microwave, infrared, visible, X-ray, and gamma ray. Nearly full sky experiments, a huge amount of effort is ongoing to measure this, make these measurements much better. Similarly, with the gravitational website, uh, with the help of the LIGO Fargo Kagarak collaboration, we are now in a pretty much, I should say, in the dawn of gravitational astronomy, where we have started making the measurements at the high frequency gravitational waves from these detectors. And soon uh, we'll be starting making measurements also from other bands, say from LISA, which we can make measurements in the millihertz range, from na in the nanohertz by pulsar timing array. And uh, pretty much maybe sooner, cosmic, uh, cosmic microwave background B mode polarization will be able to map the extremely, extremely low frequency gravitational wave signal. And uh, in uh, long term, in a couple of, uh, when maybe 15 to 20 years from now, we'll be in a situation of third generation gravitational detectors cos called Cosmic Explorer, Einstein Telescope which will push our horizon to something of typically about one to few uh, redshift to something like 70 to 50 to 70 redshift. So we are basically going to enter in a time scale where gravitational wave probes, uh, using gravitational wave probes, will be seeing the cosmos deep uh, up to high redshift and in multiple bands. And I would really say this is an excellent opportunity for us to use uh, this new probe along with electromagnetic observations to basically know what all is going on, or at least a subset of them, what is going on over there. So as I already mentioned to you, this spectrum of gravitational wave signal, which you expect ranges from extremely low frequency to high frequency. And, and the things you meant to remember is that as you push yourself to higher and higher frequencies, you basically start seeing black holes which are of typically stellar origin or smaller black holes so lvk in future like india cosmic explorer Einstein telescope will be able to see a, a solar mass uh, a black holes of a few solar mass of few tens to hundreds of solar mass and in future with lisa uh, in millihertz range we expect to see compact binary coalescence of a supermassive binary black holes uh, a few billion solar mass of this can be seen from nanohertz range by PTA and the cosmic uh, gravitational wave background possibly generated from inflationary scenarios can be seen in the B mode polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And my today's talk, though I talked about multi messenger and it is possible for all these different bands, I'm just going to focus on this extremely left hand, right hand side probe, which is about the high frequency gravitational wave signals. And I will more narrow it down to only the science goals which are mainly possible right now from LVK, but certainly there are exciting science possible from Cosmic Explorer and Einstein Telescope, which I'm unfortunately not able to cover today in my this talk. 
So what have we learned from LVK as of now? This is our set of around 90 gravitational resources we have detected so far. I call it the gravitational piece, the, the third catalog. Uh, and these bunch of sources comes out, are have, have seen across a wide range of pressure and a wide range of masses. These sources are going to be, which I've already explored in up to the uh, third uh, observation run, is going to increase quite a few in number when you are entering the next year, like design sensitivity or from O4, uh, gravitational wave of observation from LVK. So here I'm showing you a plot about what we expect to see from these gravitational wave detectors in the time scale of the, let's say, for the next 20 to 30 years. So let's at first focus on the plot in the left-hand side, which is about the gravitational wave sources, which are detectable from terrestrial detectors, such as LVK, uh, advanced LIGO shown in blue. And I can see that we can typically see up to about a sheet of one for a total solar mass system uh, around 100 or, uh, or so. That's your peak position. But as some cosmic explorer shown in magenta and uh, Einstein telescope shown in green, you can see something of, up, to, up to like 70 or 80 of ratio. And around the mass range, it is ranging from a few solar mass to about uh, 10,000 solar masses. So that's the horizon we're going to push. And in the other side with LISA or phase based gravitational detectors, the types of sources you're going to see are quite different. As you can see over here, something between a few thousands to few um, tens of millions of solar mass systems, again, up to a pretty high ratio, something around a ratio of 30. So what you can now realize is that we have a completely new kind of sources available to us to study the cosmos. As of now, our main sources of information were coming from cosmic microwave background, large scale structure, supernova, quasars. But now we are going to make measurements from a company, another new kind of transient sources in market, which is the gravitational wave sources. Of course, there's another new population of sources coming up, which is called the FRBs. That's also very interesting sources. But today's talk, let's focus only on the gravitational wave stuff. So uh, with these kind of sources like uh, binary systems of masses from few solar masses to few millions of about billion solar masses, we are going to study the cosmos up to pretty much like redshift of 20 to 30, very deep. And what I'm going to talk about in the next, uh, over the next time is how this can really help us in understanding the cosmology in the setup of multi-messenger cosmology, where in my opinion, there are two sectors which you can study. One is the upper arrow which I've shown over here, that this bunch of gravitational resources, which I'm going to detect, let's say binary neutron stars shown in yellow by dots in this uh, diagram in the left, or black holes shown in uh, white dots, which you can explore up to very high redshift. How I can use these sources to study the cosmic history and the, the ingredients of cosmos, what is dark matter, what is dark energy, that's not part of the top part I address, like how I can use the transient sources up to higher shift to basically study the physical cosmology. The other part is if I now ask this question, whatever we have learned from electromagnetic observations, let's say we have learned about star formation rate, we have learned about stellar metallicity evolution, we have learned about evolution of stellar mass in the universe and how the galaxy property behaves. How can that tell us anything about the property of black hole that we are going to measure in the coming years? That means I am now say, telling you that, that there are two sectors of multi messenger cosmology. One is about learning about physical cosmology from gravitational resources. Other is about learning about gravitational resources from our current understanding of the stellar properties uh, using EM observations. The first part of my talk, I'm going to mainly talk about how I can use gravitational wave sources to study physical cosmology. And towards the later half of my talk, I'll talk about 
what can we learn about black hole properties or compact objects properties from uh, our current understanding of the metallicity evolution and the evolution and so on. So to give you a simple one slide about a few of our open questions in the field of cosmology, certainly these are not the only questions, there are many of them, but I'm possibly going to only cover a few of them here. So I missed some of my favorites. So of course, our uh, ex excellent observations from CMB, large scale structure, supernova has helped us in constructing the so-called the standard model cosmology. We call it the lambda cold dark matter model. But there are quite a few things which are yet we have to understand. We have to understand is it really lambda or dark energy is something else? And what is cold dark matter? On top, there are a few questions which has come up new uh, quite in the last five to seven years. Is about what is really the cosmic expansion rate today, or the what is the value of Hubble constant? And one of the other pressing questions which we have is: Is general theory of relativity really the correct theory of gravity at all scales, or is there a need, we need a modification in that part to uh, explain our observations? So, in the first part of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk about how we can use uh, gravitational wave sources to measure the expansion history of the universe. So uh, to give you what kind of sources you typically expect, we expect sources like bright sirens, like sources with EM counterparts. Those are like your binary neutron star systems and maybe neutron star black hole systems. And you can have sources without electromagnetic counterpart like binary black hole systems. I'm going to talk about both the sectors about how they can be useful to measure cosmology. So when we say about I want to measure cosmology or cosmological parameters, one of the main interesting things for us is to map the expansion history of the universe. And the reason why this is pretty interesting to cosmologists is because if I can go deep in redshift and I can map the expansion history of the universe, it can tell me about what is, are the different energy budgets in the universe. That's pretty cool. That means if you see this plot in, over here in the y-axis, I'm showing you the expansion rate h of z over one plus z. And in the x-axis, I'm showing you the redshift. This black solid line is the uh, curve you would expect when it is lambda cold dark matter scenario for Planck cosmology. And any variation in that, is, if around dark, in the dark energy properties or when dark energy is dominated is basically shown up in that small box where you basically start seeing a slight enhancement in, in the rate of expansion. What really gravitational wave is going to tell us is that this magenta box which I have painted over there is we, as I've already told you, we can see the binary black holes through gravitational waves pretty much up to the sheet of one using and LIGO design sensor everything. Which means if you compare that with our expansion rate of the universe as a function of redshift, we are going to explore the range which is uh, using which we can explore dark energy equation of state using gravitational wave sources. And also we can measure the value of Hubble constant. Here I'm showing you a simple equation about how this expression H of Z relates with uh, these basic quantities of the uh, ingredients of the universe like Hubble constant, H naught, omega matter, and dark energy equation of states shown by W of Z. So uh, it's, it is basically not required to say to this audience that it's several years now, we are still struggling to find a, a value of H naught, which is in agreement between the early universe probes and the late universe probes. We typically start, started seeing a discrepancy some something like three sigma and it's now gone to close to five sigma measurement. We, both the measurements are not quite in agreement. My, this big chart which you are seeing is keeps on evolving. This is the, the latest one which was prepared by Elena Di Valentino in, in her one of our review articles. My today's talk is going to be that small bit of pieces in the gravitational nerve sector uh, about the measurement which we have done as of now and how that is going to be useful to uh, in future 
to pin down or at least to shed light on the value of H naught as seen by us, the gravitational and cosmologist. So first of all, uh, let's get back to the situation where we have an electromagnetic counterpart. So if when you have an electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave source, so as shown by Bernard Schultz back in 1986, that gravitational wave sources are an excellent distance tracer, which means, which is what it means that if I can measure the strain of the gravitational wave, I can measure the chirp property of the gravitational waves. And when I combine these two, I can get a very nice measurement of the luminosity distance to the source without any additional calibration without caring about any additional source with astrophysical source with which I need to calibrate. But there are some challenges which you need to uh, fix before making it perfect as usual. Certainly we are subjected to inclination angle uncertainties. The, uh, if the, whether the object is phase on or the object is age on, it can, you can make a wrong estimate of its distance if you are really not able to understand the inclination angle. Also, we need to understand the main, uh, needs to understand that the detector calibration pretty well to under, to make sure that our luminosity distance uh, uh, measurements are not biased. But if we trust our measurement and we say that we are we are able to do it carefully, and if there is a bright siren, means I could I can uh, measure an electromagnetic counterpart and I can see a whole galaxy of this particular source. I can combine both of them to get a measurement of the Hubble constant by basically taking the ratio of the rest shift with the luminosity distance after correcting for this peculiar velocity shown by this GP. And when it is done, and, and this was done uh, for the first time by a LIGO Hubble Kagura collaboration using the famous uh, binary neutron star merger GW170817, using which we have found uh, H naught value around close to 70, it's a, a pretty large error bar as shown over here in this uh, orange line in the curve below. In green and uh, uh, saffron agent uh, shaded region, we show the uh, constraint which is possible from Planck and shoes measurements. But this particular uh, measure- Sorry, yeah. Suvodi, we, we missed you. Oh, you missed me? Okay. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, now it's okay. So um, why did you miss me? Sorry about that. Should I, did you hear what I talked about uh, inclusion? It was, the, it, it, uh, it was like a, the last 20 or 30 seconds of. Okay, so I'll just repeat the what to, I was, okay. Thank you. So can, about you please, that? can you please also tell about the inclination angle? I missed it. Oh, sure, absolutely. So, uh, see, about when you uh, measure a gravitational wave source, you do not know whether the object is phase on or object is age on. Now, if an object is phase on, you get more gravitational wave signal than when it is age on in simple language. Now, if I do not know this a priori and I make a luminosity distance measurement, I may see an object which is phase on. And I can think about, I can make a luminosity distance measurement, which is pretty near, this looks appears brighter. Then if it is edge on, it may appear that it is further out. So this means luminosity distance and inclination angle are a degenerate quantity. And we need to break this degeneracy by uh, some other uh, additional observations. So this is possible using gravitational beta itself because of polarizations. So the two different polarizations of gravitational waves are impacted by the inclination angle in a slightly different way. So by when you, if you can measure both the polarization states, you can break this degeneracy between the inclination angle and the, and the luminosity distance. You have also several other ways of doing it. Like if there are higher order modes in the gravitational wave signal, you can even include those higher order modes, again, to break the degeneracy between the inclination angle and the luminosity distance. And one more, which is quite interesting, and indeed happened for GW170817, is that if the electromagnetic counterpart we detect with a jet, then that jet, jet measurements gives us a constraint on the typical range of the inclination angle. And when you combine that with a range of inclination angle measured from 
at the jet measurement, we can re reduce the uncertainty in the luminosity distance. So these are our couple of hopes and which you, have put, you can use to uh, uh, break the degeneracy between the inclination angle and the luminosity distance. Is that clear? Okay, I hope so. So, so for uh, GW170817, uh, as I already told you, that we could make a measurement of from the this bright siren at first with just taking care of the luminosity distance measurement. Then we could see a red a jet and which was measured by this VLBI observation. And some model with some modeling of the jet, we can make an estimate of the inclination angle which helped us in reducing the uncertainty in the, in, in the uh, luminous distance. And when you take into account that, you see the estimate of the uh, Hubble constant in, the, in blue, which is obtained by Hodokazaka et al. Uh, uh, back in 2020. Uh, so what it means is that you can basically start seeing a improved measurement of Hubble constant if you can see an electromagnetic signal of, uh, from all from the jet uh, and break the degeneracy with, between the inclination angle and the luminosity distance. But this particular such a measurement needs extensive amount of care to make sure that your modeling of the jet is not impacting your H0. And we are doing several ongoing studies where you will have to explore this in much, much more detail. And one of the challenges is peculiar velocity corrections we would like to make to make sure that these sources are not uh, getting impacted by the peculiar velocity of the galaxies. And this you can also take into account in our current measurements by specifically doing a joint reconstruction of the velocity field from the galaxy surface. So if you can do so, if you can make up, uh, take care of the inclination angle and you take care of the peculiar velocities, one can show that we can obtain a measurement of H naught to something like of the order like 2% when you combine so, uh, so around 50 bright binary neutron stars, which is, uh, which is possible maybe in a much more longer time scale than what is proposed over here, but that, that's not important. What is the key take home message from this plot you should take is with about 50 sources, we can reach a 2% measurement of the value of H naught. As of now, we have only one bright neutron star by a neutron star event. So we have to wait maybe a couple of more years uh, to get to a two person measurement from bright sirens. So let me now come back to the, the other side, which is about the dark standard sirens or the sources which are without electromagnetic counterparts. So these are the sources which are heavier. So they are more luminous in the gravitational of emission. And so you can see them typically up to high redshift or higher luminous resistance. As a result, as I already told you, if I can see something up to high redshift, I can make measurements beyond cosmological parameter, beyond H naught, such as dark energy equation of state as well. So let's see how can we use a bunch of gravitational sources like dark sirens to do cosmology. So dark sirens are black holes. Uh, the question is, if you see a couple of them in the sky, so I have, this is my cartoon diagram to explain those, their spatial distribution. These yellow stars are my binary, star, binary dark sirens. And for each of them, I have measured a luminosity at distance. So the question is, are these sources going to be distributed in the sky randomly? Or are they going to be distributed in a cluster? The, the answer to this question is, they are not going to be distributed randomly in the sky, but rather they're going to be following the underlying distribution of dark matter or in simple the galaxies. So it, if these black holes are forming in the galaxies, the underlying galaxy distribution is, will be followed by this, these black holes. And here I'm showing you an image from illustrative simulation where these dark regions, the a dark pink or the blackish region is the places where I have more matter. And the regions which are whitish are the void, where this is more the empty regions. So you would expect the, the galaxies to be, to, to be present where there's more, more dense regions. And that's the place where you, you will see black holes to merge. One of the very key properties of these uh, large scale structure distribution 
as you can already see from this image that it is a, there is a spatial clustering objects don't form randomly or homogeneously throughout but they are spatially clustered where they have more matter and these galaxies are an excellent tracer of redshift and the gravitational sources are an excellent tracer of distance so i have two quantities one quantity is uh, is a distance tracer other quantity is a redshift tracer and if i can make a friendship between these two i can basically make cosmology cal measurements by combining these two things because cosmology is all about as i told you about the expansion history part is that if if i can measure the luminosity distance if i can measure the ratio i can i can understand what are the cosmological parameters so let's spend a few minutes to understand how this technique is going to work so what i have proposed is one can explore cross correlation of gravitational sources with galaxies what it means is that you are now asking the question about if i go to this uh, a particular region in the sky where i have seen bunch of gravitational sources let's take by this simple uh, magenta uh, tomographic bin in the left hand side and in the same patch of the sky i have measured galaxy spectroscopically for this particular example and then i am asking that if i throw circles of difference radii and i calculate the probability of finding galaxies near the gravitational sources at different as a function of different distances from it then that particular probability that or the excess probability in comparison to a random distribution is going to follow the underlying uh, distribution of dark matter and you are going to see that there is going to be a correlation or the, the a correlation signal between the gravitational sources and the galaxy and this correlation between the two is going to tell me that what is the true clustering ratio of the gravitational sources which i can infer from the spectroscopically inferred galaxies so that's the basic idea but now let me explain this to you in a by a simple cartoon that so in the left hand side you are seeing that i have made a tomographic bin of gravitational sources as a function of distance in the right hand side i have chosen a particular bin and with that bin i am now performing a cross correlation of gravitational sources with, with galaxies which basically means i am calculating that quantity mentioned over there in the equation let's say for the first bin i calculate the value of excess probability dp i see something which is which is correlated which is consistent with zero i go to the next bin i again see something consistent with zero i go to the other next bin i see now a non zero correlation value of dp for this particular bin i again go to the next bin my i see my signal goes down and again it sees goes down so now you can see that this particular bin which i have seen has more correlation with the gravitational sources with the galaxies in comparison to the other bins that means i can now associate uh, our clustering ratio of these gravitational sources inferred from the spectroscopically measured galaxies and i can do this for several tomographic bin of luminosity distance with different tomographic bins of galaxies and when i combine both these sectors i can make a measurement of the cosmological parameters which is which are impacting the luminosity distance so what we have done now is but to do this kind of measurements we should be lucky enough to have gravitational uh, uh, electromagnetic observations available nearly full sky because gravitational wave we can sources we can see almost full sky so we need overlapping sky area gravitational wave, electromagnetic observations as i already told you we need good spectroscopic galaxy surveys if the if the, if the photos the errors are there then it will contaminate our measurement and we are really lucky now in a time where we have both these possible here i am showing you a plot of as a function of redshift the gas distribution which will be measured from upcoming surveys such as spherix uh, daisy and euclid in different colors 
in gray shaded region is the region beyond which we do not expect to see gravitational wave sources with high signal to noise ratio above eight. So you focus anything in the left hand side in this plot and uh, sources which are nearby are brighter. That means their luminosity resistance errors are going to be smaller. So we need a good spectroscopic galaxy surveys at low redshift, nearly full sky, which can be used to measure the cross correlation signal. And the most powerful technique to do that is basically the surveys such as Spherex and DAISY, which are going to be an excellent, uh, going to play a crucial role in exploring the synergy between LVK and, and the surveys. So here I'm showing you a plot of what is possible from LVK plus Spherex and LVK plus, plus DAISY after five years of observation in LIGO Virgo color design sensitivity for sources with sky localization error less than or equal to 25 square degrees. What you can see in red and, and uh, blue, uh, the measurements from Spherex and DAISY respectively for the value of H0 and also the gravitational wave bias parameter, which basically traces, tells you how the galaxies, uh, how the gravitational wave sources traces the underlying galaxy distribution. For these particular sets of simulations, we have injected a value of gravitational wave bias, something around two with around no redshift evolution. This is consistent with zero. So the value of alpha is consistent with zero. And the value of H0 was injected something around uh, 60, 68. So you can see that we are able to make pretty robust, uh, accurate measurement of the value of Hubble constant to something like a, about well, 1.8 to 2% with about five years of observations. By combining binary black hole systems, which have no electromagnetic counterpart, but only have good luminosity distance measurements and good sky localization error. These measurements will degrade a bit if you include with photo Z measurements, but that's not completely hopeless. This is definitely possible. What fraction of the sources have uh, the sky localization good enough to do that much? So it's tip. So from LVK. So car, so if you are able to include Kagra, this is going to be about thirty to forty percent sources. But if Kagra is not operational by now, this number can go down to something like ten to fifteen percent. Okay. Uh, so what about uh, dark energy equation of space? Here you are seeing a plot of, again, uh, analysis from simulations showing you about how we, well we can do joint reconstruction of H0 and dark energy equation of states shown by W0 parameter and gravitational wave bias parameter, because that's something, this is a nuisance parameter, we must emerge as well, because we really do not know what this quantity is. But what is interesting is that this is the quantity which gives you a right away a handle about the how black holes and galaxy properties are connected by this gravitational wave bias parameter. So what you are seeing here, you at first focus on the dark energy equation of state, and we can get to a something like a five to six, say around 6% measurement of dark energy equation of state from LVK with about uh, 3,500 gravitational wave sources. This number looks pretty big in, if you compare with the upcoming electromagnetic surveys which can make to a measurement of few of a few percent, like a one percent measurements or so. But this particular channel is very promising because with Cosmic Explorer and Einstein telescope, using cross correlation with gravitational resources, we can beat the error to out less square root of n in future and go to sub percent measurement of dark energy equation of state using gravitational resources. We can also measure by gravitational bias parameter pretty accurately as I've shown here in the previous plot which is going to be a very neat probe to tell you for the first time how the black holes of different masses and pressure and uh, uh, mass masses evolves as a function of pressure and it depends on the galaxy properties. So before I go to the next part, uh, is there any question up to here? Was the um, uh, signal noise of eight threshold, is that about localization 
or just about being confident in the detection. I was thinking that if you uh, have a cross-correlation technique, you can potentially push down to lower signal noise if you can localize them. That's true. That's right. So the bottleneck for cross-correlation is chylocorrelation error. Basically, the, phys the curving length is sustains. Uh, that's the clear to us. So if you go to really high redshift, if you see a source at high redshift, and my sky correlation is pretty bad, that particular source is not going to be informative to, uh, about the clustering redshift information because cost correlation signal completely gets blurred up. So our base measurements are significantly impacted by the sky localization error. If we can improve that, uh, that is going to see, uh, improve our measurements quite a lot, actually. But the problem is, uh, given our population of sources we detect, and whatever we have seen as of now, we are most likely not going to see large fraction of uh, well-localized sources. So we have to wait longer, throw away all the bad sky localization sources and wait for a very a few good sources to make a measurement uh, and applying this to the cross correlation technique. On that topic, can you help? <clears throat> so you had this 25 square degree cutoff. Can you help? Is there any intuition you can provide about why this is the right, um, why this is the right size that's required to, to get any power oh. out of the cross correlation? Nice, thank you. So I didn't, I couldn't talk about this part. So when I talk about cross correlation or spatial clustering, the fundamental question to ask is typically up to what scales objects are strongly correlated. So correlation function typically falls out pretty steep, but about 100, 150 megaparts of our age, you see some kind of correlation between the, between the galaxies. Uh, and you expect a similar behavior also for gravitational sources and galaxies. So that means that if I have a sky localization error, like few hundreds of square degree, which substance a co-moving scale much bigger than 150 or 200 megaparts, then I have completely smeared out my correlation function and I do not have any information I can use. So that's what sets the scale. So 25 square degree is a, is a selection which you have used, but we have also checked our results for 10 square degree and 100 square degree. For 100 square degree sources, our error bars blows up by factor of two. Uh, above which, if you go, you really don't get much measurements, uh, much useful measurements within five years of observation. So basically what you're saying is that at the average distance, the distance of your average sources, the clustering scale subtends a couple degrees on the sky. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Let me see if I, if I have a plot on that, that will be real. Yeah, I have it. I, I, can you see that part? It is a hidden slice, but you can yeah. see it here. So see, this is our correlation function measured back in 2005 by the Daniel Eisenstein. And this is the, so it is strongly correlated and it falls to zero pretty sharp, but up to almost 150 megaparts of our age, we have some correlation signal. Now, if I tell you that I cannot measure anything beyond, in small scale beyond this, so you basically infer something which is extremely weak, which is the noise domain. So you basically don't have much statistical information you can infer. Whereas if I have a source which is well localized, so only a small fraction of the performing scale beyond which I, I have to wash out my signal, which is maybe here, then I have all this space, I have a correlation function which I can measure, I can use that to, uh, to get information about the cluster mesh. So that's the key. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions before I move to the next part? I should yeah, hurry anyway now, I have not much time left. So if there's no more questions, I'll take the questions later, I'll now proceed. There's a question no. here in the audience. Yep. Uh, yeah, so if I understand this correctly, you're assuming a constant stellar mass to black hole merger ratio. The stellar, the merger ratio is right now in this analysis, we have modeled by following the star formation rate with a typical delay time distribution. Means if you, if the, if black holes have formed from stars, they need some time to find another black hole to merge. And so there is a typical delay time between the black holes to form and the black holes to merge. So we have taken a typically like a 500 mega years of delay time in these simulations and as Madhav the Kingston star formation rate. 
for for this particular setup. We have not played with any other parameter. So the parameter which we have played with is the delay time distributions of the black holes uh, too much. Okay, yeah. Uh, so following up on this is like you're talking about sub percent uh, measurements at some point. Are you at some point limited by your astrophysical uncertainties there? Yes. Wait for my last few slides. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm getting there. Okay, so uh, now let me tell you about whatever I told you as a um, st studies from simulations. Now we have a uh, bunch of gravitational resources which have detected around 90 of them. And we have a technique available. So when we have a technique available, we can up make it a proof of principle measurements. Of course, with just 90 gravitational resources, with most of them having very bad sky localization error, it is really difficult to get any meaningful measurement of the Hubble constant, uh, but it's only a proof of principle to see uh, how this method works and basically for us to learn what are the major challenges which you're going to face from the data. So what we have done is uh, we have applied our cross correlation technique on a partial, uh, uh, on a basically nearly full sky photo Z service. We have a galaxy service from HDSS, which is about partial sky. But that's not a particularly very useful to us because most of the gravitational sources are not overlapping with those surveys. So what we end up choosing is 2MPZ and Y supercost galaxy surveys which are nearly full sky. I have shown over here by two maps, uh, top uh, top panels, and the they are distributed again up to a very limited redshift range, something between zero point about low redshift to something up to 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Uh, the shaded region in the lower panel is a region uh, uh, above which your galaxy galaxy clustering signal is short mass dominant. So, with these distributions of the sky surveys of the gravitation of the galaxies, let us ask what is there in the sky on the GWTC3 catalog. So, we have made a selection of, of sources which are having better sky localization error, better than 30 square degree, less than equal to 30 square degree. So when you put this selection criteria, we see there are eight gravitational resources in the GWTC3 catalog. And in the right-hand side, I'm showing you the probability distri posterior distributions of the luminosity distance for these sources. So the most informative one is the one GW190814, which is pretty, um, on the magenta, on the one which is in uh, orange, this, this is a typically very well localized source and also having a nice luminosity resistance measure. And we end up seeing that this is the one which end up giving us the best measurement of H naught from the cross correlation technique as well. So, short, long story short, I can take the, uh, more questions on this uh, later. That what we have done basically, we have. Uh, calculated the clustering, the cross correlation signal between gravitational resources and galaxies, yet we do not measure any clustering signal. So our, our choices in the measurements are now very much dependent by our selection functions in the redshift range in the galaxy surface and the errors in the galaxy surface, errors uh, 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 in the galaxy surface, sorry. So what you have done is we measured the clustering signal shown by this hat CLGWG, and we modeled the uh, theoretical CLGWG as a bias tracer of the galaxy galaxy correlation function. And you do a tomographic estimates of this quantity as a function of redshift for this all eight sources by combining with the two MPZ and Y supercars. So using this, we have made an extremely, extremely weak measurement of the uh, expansion history of the universe by marginalizing over the gravitational bias parameters and its extra dependence and omega matter. So uh, certainly these measurements are pretty bad right now. As you can see, 68 plus 26 minus 6.6. We have checked for a couple of systematic efforts in our measurements. We, uh, we have seen that the variation of the galaxy bias parameter is not impacting our results much, neither changing the cosmological parameters to obtain the galaxy power spectrum. 
selection functions in the y sub r cross at log, variation in the covariance matrix estimations, these are all negligible. But one of the key things which impacts our results are basically the redshift error. The Fordowski errors plays a significant role in, in impacting the H0 values and its error bars or the posterior distribution. Though the, though the map value remains pretty much similar, but the error bars or the, it gets bumpy as well is when you have a slightly higher, if you take the bin size of the galaxy surface narrower on all of the order of similar, which is comparable with the photos here. So with these uh, measurements, uh, we have, what I have seen is that with photos in surface, our roadmap is going to be pretty challenging and we are going to uh, really mitigate a lot of uncertainties to exp explore cross correlation with gravitational sources and photos in surface, uh, and uh, as long our spectroscopy samples are not available. So the remaining some time, I'm going to tell you about some other aspects that we can explore from gravitational sources, such as testing GR. So testing GR from gravitational propagation is an extremely neat way uh, to measure something called as a frictional term, which is shown by this blue, this gamma Z parameter. So when gravitational wave propagates to the space time, as I'm showing from this cartoon diagram, if these Gamma parameter, which is basically explores the change in the uh, effective Planck mass, is non-zero. You can basically see an enhancement or a reduction in the gravitational strain than what you would have expected in under general theory of relativity. There can be also other effects like uh, the gravitons can have a mass, the speed of the gravitational wave can be different from photons. But those quantities shown by these red boxes are constrained from the bright standard set measurements such as GW170817. But the gamma Z parameter are still not well constrained. And this is a quantity which we don't really constrain very well either from EM observations. So what I'm going to tell you now how gravitational resources can be useful is basically reconstructing this parameter called gamma Z in a data-driven way. So let's see the simple example where in the left hand side, let's say I can measure from just from the gravitation of data, the luminosity distance measurement. And I want to ask that are these measurements impacted by anything like a frictional term in comparison to what I would have expected in the, uh, if there is no such term exists. And uh, that quantity I explore in terms of this DLEM, which is the, luminosity distance uh, EM observational probe will explore. And the balance between both this sector is by this e raised to minus integral over gamma z over one plus zeta. The part which is unknown to us is basically gamma z. What is also unknown to us is the luminosity distance to a gravitational sources from an EM probe because we do not measure an electromagnetic counterpart. So how can I do it for dark silence? So the idea is very simple is that uh, these sources, the luminous distance of the of to a gravitational source, will be related to the underlying as acoustic baryon acoustic oscillation scales of the galaxies by the sound horizon over one plus z times the angular diameter distance. And for a theory of gravity, which is under a metric theory and where the photon numbers are conserved, you can write the angular diameter distance in terms of the luminosity distance by this one plus z whole square term as shown over there. That means now if I see a couple of gravitational wave sources at different luminosity distance from which I can measure the luminosity distance and at the same tomographic bins, I can estimate galaxies and from galaxies, I measured the theta BAO. Then by the, taking the product of these two data sectors, luminosity distance and the theta BAO, it should be just related to one plus z times sound horizon, which you can measure again from CMB observations. And if GR is the correct theory of gravity, then this will be an identity relation, which means that this term in the box, xi naught plus one plus xi naught, uh, one minus xi naught times this uh, factor is going to be one. 
but if gr is not the correct theory of gravity then this this particular identity equation will start breaking up and it will start seeing an evolution in this equation so by just comparing three length scales gravitational of distance angular diameter distance uh, barrier and acoustic oscillation scale from beta and sound horizon from cmb i can make a reconstruction of this xi node or the or the gamma z parameter in general as a function of redshift and i can tell you whether there is any deviation in gr in a completely model independent way and here you are seeing a forecast from simulations to measure such a frictional term from ligo virgo kakra in five years of observation time typically we will see around 3000 to 5000 sources and this is a relative error you would expect so i am changing here the uh, uh, x axis by enhancing the number of sources you will detect from lvk as you can see that we can get to a measurement of basically less than 2% with about uh, 4000 gravitational waves which is very very interesting now because such a measurement and with such a precision is practically out of scope in from third generation if third generations are not detectors are not available uh, from bright center sirens so with dark center sirens we can make very nice measurements of this kind with uh, few thousands of binary black holes so in long term so finally there is a i will now get get back to the point where i would like to uh, talk about some of the astrophysical propositions or the other part of the multi messenger cosmology which is about how can i understand about the transient sources from uh, from the current observations of galaxy surveys and here i will address the, one of the questions about the population assumptions so let's take what multi messenger view we can take on black hole properties today's talk i'm going to talk about only about individual events and not about stochastic background but you are free feel 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 free to ask me any question on that of course so black holes we see we don't see black holes we see binary black holes and we see them in different masses we don't know how these sources have formed from what kind of stars in what kind of galaxies they are merging what are the dependence on the stellar mass stellar metallicity star formation rates these are come all quantities are unknown to us so if i take the our best measurements of star formation rate by combining several lm surveys i can we have a measurement or a typical fit called the manuel dickinson star formation rate i am showing here in the lower panel and take different delay time distribution where you form black holes from a star and then that black hole form another uh, black hole to merge and this can happen in different scenarios there can be a hierarchical mergers there can be a common envelope scenario for all different scenarios your delay time distribution is going to be different we do not know right now but if if at best we take a power law model which is motivated from the fact that if if all the black holes are distributed the distance between them are typically flat in flat in log space you would expect a delay time distribution which is like one over the delay time and such a distribution is parameterized by two parameters called the uh, minimum delay time value we call it td mean and uh, and the spectral index uh, shown by the uh, quantity called d so when you take such a model and you ask how the black hole population varies from the star star formation rate you get the plot in the lower right panel where the number of gravitational resources per gigaparsec cube per year as a function of redshift is shown for mega dickinson in uh, in red and blue dash line and for behruzi model that's another model of star formation rate uh, in solid lines for two different delay time distribution the main take home from this plot is that if there is a longer delay time bit for the black holes to merge that means the the black holes will typically uh, merge at a merge at a later lower ratio and hence you will see the peak in the distribution at a lower ratio because the look back time of a few giga years is required from it to form and since it merge so there's a difference along with that there is another thing which will play a crucial role 
is that the, because we don't see black hole, but we see the or binary black holes, black holes needs to find, needs to find another black hole to merge. So there will be a, a mixing of black holes between different redshifts. So black hole formed at a particular redshift may be able to find another black hole which, have, which has formed at a lower redshift or at a higher redshift. So that means the black holes which are seen to merge, both the black holes did not have formed at a common redshift, but must very likely to form in a very different redshift. And because the, we have seen from EM observations that the stellar metallicity evolves with redshift as shown over here in this lower panel diagram, metallicity evolution as a function of redshift, you would expect that the impact of this metallicity evolution will also impact your black hole properties. So when we, un, when we want to understand this, how black hole properties uh, differs, uh, black hole properties of the masses changes at, at this function of stellar mass, what you see is that the, if the stars are pretty heavy or big, uh, when, when there are less metals, and if so, the corresponding black holes are going to be heavier as well. That means the black holes which are going to observe as a function of redshift, they're typically the cutoff scale or the, what we call as the parent stability supernova scale, which is expected as the, for the first generation black holes, we are going to, can easily show our redshift evolution. So these are the two quantities where delay time distribution can play a crucial role in the astronomical properties of black holes. But how can we really disentangle these two, these complicated sectors? So one of the very interesting probe to stellar mass or stellar metallicity are emission lines. Emission line galaxies or line intensity mapping is an excellent probe to the stellar properties of the galaxy. I can measure lines, say H alpha, O2, O3, carbon lines to understand uh, the typical uh, metallicity evolution and the uh, star formation rate, stellar metallicity in these galaxies. And I'm showing you here a simple uh, image from Phil Connor's uh, plot uh, that if I take a simulation of this intensity mapping signal, galaxies are the extremely bright sources shown by these blue dots and large intensity mapping is everything which is diffuse or weak you can measure. So what we have proposed uh, is that in a paper by myself and Azade uh, is that gravitational wave sources, their populations, uh, their merger rate, their mass distribution is going to show an inevitable correlation. Please remember this is not cross correlation. This is just correlation in their properties with the emission line galaxies or the line, emission, line density mapping. So let's see this extremely complicated plot for some time. What it means, okay, I'm slightly over time, sorry about that, that uh, if you plot the total RMS fluctuation in the uh, uh, line density mapping in the y-axis and number of gravitational sources in the x-axis for different lines, H alpha, O2, O3, for different delay time distribution, large delay time shown by this, uh, typically uh, uh, large size marker sizes and small delay time shown by these small uh, marker sizes and in color for different redshifts. Sorry for this extremely complicated plot. What is the extremely interesting over here is that you can start seeing very interesting correlations in the properties of emission with the emission and galaxies in the gravitational wave properties. And these you can directly explore from data. So what we're proposing to do is that you can take gravitational sources as a function of luminosity distance. You measure the course as a function of redshift emission and galaxy properties or line density mapping signal. And you make a plot of their correlation as a function of distance and redshift. And when you do so for different formation channels, the correlation properties will be different. And you can explore that uh, with the, as a for, by combining LVK with sphere X and LVK with JC to measure a value of the delay time and its power law index. So this is a very simple generative model where we use the simple Fisher analysis to show how the error bar will look 
when you combine LVK with JZ and LVK with square X for two years and five years for as shown in different colors. There is going to be very much additional complications like how the mass distribution is going to evolve. So now I want to address this question which was asked me before that how, the, how is this going to impact your H0 measurements from the population side? So it is very much true that this redshift evolution, uh, if you are not able to really understand properly, it can impact your H0 inference or at least can make our error bars larger uh, if we cannot mitigate this, this uncertainty. But the good part is that we can have additional uh, signals like from emission land galaxies or land intensity mapping, which, which we can use to basically narrow down our uncertainties in, our, in the uh, population sector. So with these, I'm quite a, towards the end of my talk. How much time Sorry. do I have? Thank Sorry. you so much. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Something like, uh, like the gap in mass Mm -hmm. In black hole populations, might that have an impact in metallicity measurements? Yes, that's correct. So black hole. Uh, so, the, so what do you expect that if the if uh, black if stars are going to have a pair instability, uh, pair instability because of electron positron pairs, so you are going to form black holes not of all masses, but rather extremely heavy stars are, may, may completely end up throwing all its materials in wings and you may not have any black holes at all. So there is going to be a mass gap in the black hole mass distribution. And the lower edge of this black hole mass distribution is what is plotted in this lower panel, I call it MPIS. Sorry for not explaining it properly because of shortage of time, really apologize for that. But uh, that's the quantity I'm plotting and, and just because the stellar uh, metallicity can, can really change the uh, physics of winds and everything, your black hole property uh, or black hole size is going to depend on the stellar metallicity. Does it answer you. your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. Yeah, one more question. Please go ahead. Yeah, isn't, uh, isn't aren't these... Um upper limits already violated by uh, the upper end of the mass distribution that we know about? Uh, uh, not yet. We have not, we couldn't violate anything yet because uh, there is a, there's a huge uncertainty in the population side, in the, just in the modeling side. We had, we can, we have seen a couple of sources at, at, in the mass gap, but we can, we can take into account those uh, by basically playing with the stellar mass properties of the parent star with the nuclear rates or the and also the redshift evolution of metallicity and so on there was a paper by led by christos myself and simone which we have shown how such measurements can uh, in uh, from gwtc3 how such measurements can impact the mass distributions of black holes i couldn't talk about it today but i'll be happy to take questions on that is it clear what I'm saying? I think so. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Yeah. Please go ahead. Valerie. Yeah. Uh, would you think that gravitational wave detection by Lisa in the future would it sort of shed some light on a more sort of accurate value for the cosmological constant and also the origins of supermassive black holes? Okay, the answer to the first question is uh, we don't know. It really depends upon how many sources you're going to see. For in Lisa, if we are lucky enough to see numerous sources, then yes, uh, we will be able to make measure the dark energy equation of state. Whether it's going to be, so we are we're going to see a huge amount of them to be more informative than the high frequency gravitational sources, which are detectable from. Cosmic Explorer Einstein telescope or not, this, this possibly is not the case as of our current estimates. Uh, yeah. And also a slightly unrelated question. Do you think uh -huh. that quantum processes like Bremstrahlung 
and photo production of gravitational radiation, would they be able to make some meaningful impact into physical cosmology? Do you think that they could ever be detected or you think this is a remote possibility? We need to, I mean, to make such measurements, we really need to un uh, understand, I think, uh, when the black holes are really nearby and modeling that part will be crucial. So I will really depend on such scenarios from third generation where I can uh, map the high frequency gravitational resources very nicely and go, uh, talk about something when the black holes are quite near and do I see any sort of, any sort of such signals. But my answer to the right now, the question is that I do not know um, how much that will be possible. I've never done that analysis yet. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you. I have two more slides to finish. I'm very sorry for taking more of your time. I'm extremely uh, sorry for that. So just to summarize, uh, I hope I have told you that uh, multiplicity cosmology is an interesting sector. I have told you a couple of science goals. There's just a few of them, which you can explore from resolved events. And that's not the full story. There's going to be stochastic background as well, which is going to be an excellent probe to higher merger rates. At least, if not, even if we do not measure, we can put a constraint on it. And all these are possible, uh, thanks to several taxpayers for paying us and make this directors possible. Uh, we have HLV running, which uh, HLVK, the Kagara will be joining us from our next observation run. And hopefully soon LIGO India will be operational as well. LISA is already funded and is likely to be operational from 2035. And in 2040 onwards, we're going to see Cosmic Explorer on the ISN telescope if it gets funded. And as gravitational life sector, EM sector is also having excellent time because we are going to see multiple telescopes which can source sea sources nearly full sky up to pretty high ratio with very good accuracy in the ratio measurement. So by combining several EM probes in both galaxy surveys and something like cosmic microwave background measurements, and by combining gravitational wave sector, we are in a really in a golden era of the multi cosmology in the coming decades. So it's a very exciting time to explore a few standard science goals and also to do new, new sciences, which we, but I may not know, there will be many surprises as well. But to do this, to get this roadmap from gravitational measurement from precision cosmology, that's going to be a really, really tough time. There are going to be numerous amount of work required to really control all possible system areas, which you can right now think about, and maybe many more which you do not know. I have only listed a few of them, and many of you have already pointed out those. Gravitational wave bias parameter, astrophysical properties of binaries, luminous wave distance inclination error, style of relation error. These are all possible errors in the gravitational wave sector. EM sector, peculiar cosmic corrections are extremely important. Photo Z errors, spectroscopic errors, errors spectroscopic surface errors. Systematics, tons of systematics associated with galaxy samples needs to be taken care. Waveform uncertainty, something I didn't talk about, plays an important role. Instrument calibration, again, something plays an important role. And we are now really at a process where we are trying to understand each of these buckets carefully and mitigate our errors from measurement to precision cosmology to see how well we'll do in future. So stay tuned for exciting results from the collaboration in future. With this note, I will end my talks with a few summary lines that uh, in future, gravitational sources will be an excellent probe to measure expansion history. Gravitational bias parameter and its shift evolution can also be measured by combining EM and GW sector. Nice test of gravity will be possible, which is pretty unique. And finally, by exploring the synergies between emission line galaxies or line intensity mapping and gravitational sources, we can explore the astrophysical properties of binary systems their, and their dependence on the middle city. Thank you so much for attention and sorry for taking more time. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, Philip, go, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Subhadeep, Phil here. Okay. 
Thanks for the nice talk. I just wanted to ask a question going back to the uh, cross correlation approach to the dark sirens, um, specifically about your model for the gravitational wave bias parameter. Um, do you allow the bias parameter to be correlated with, say, the source masses or spins? I'm imagining a scenario where you have different subpopulations of black holes, um, you know, that might map uh, onto the, the, the galaxy in different ways in terms of, uh, you know, tracing the baryonic matter. For instance, primordial black holes, right, would be very different from stellar black holes. Absolutely. It's a very good point. That's an ongoing work. So in this analysis, the answer is no. We did not take into account that. Currently, a couple of students from me, actually basically from Perimeter, are working with me on exactly on this sector about understanding, um, basically making a forward modeling of gravitational wave bias parameter for different formation channels and including PBH scenarios as well to explore how this bias parameter varies with redshift masses and scales. Right. Gotcha. But right, but we complete so when we so we take a measurement in the simulations, we don't do it, but when we make a H dot measurement, we marginalize over everything. So we we kind of try to be sure that within a within a uh, particular model of bias parameter, we are marginalizing over it, but there can be some additional errors which can induce. So we, we are working on it. Right, understood. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's give another round of applause for our speaker. Great, thank you so much for your time and uh, for the nice questions. I'll possibly see a couple of you next uh, tomorrow or day after, so yeah, thank you. Excellent, so let's stay in touch. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>